the salt of sea air, freshly cut grass. Danger. A sense of smell is something many of us take for granted, but what if it wasn't there? COVID-19 infections often lead to a loss of smell. The impact can be serious. Fires may burn unnoticed. COVID survivors may lose interest in eating or fall into a deep depression. Let's look at the strange ways COVID is tied up with our noses and neural networks. Out of all the senses, most people say they could do without smell. But have you thought about the consequences for your life and job? About 60% of those infected with the coronavirus will have had problems smelling or tasting. For Karen Steigleiter, falling ill with COVID-19 was a professional disaster. The 53-year-old did not have severe symptoms, but was left unable to smell or taste anything. As the owner of a confectionery shop, she needed to test the quality of her cakes and chocolates. If I have a glass of wine, for example, and at the same time had to taste a glass of vinegar, I couldn't tell the difference. Both of them taste acidic, but I couldn't tell you which one is vinegar and which is the wine. Alessandro Bozzato says her symptoms are typical. Smell loss occurs when the coronavirus infects cells that support neurons in the nose. He prescribes smell training as therapy, in which patients relearn prescribed scents, such as those of roses and lemons. After losing their sense of smell, patients can do this smell training to stimulate damaged nerve cells and start the process of healing or regeneration. Karen Steigleiter has been using four different scents a day to reactivate her sense of smell. Coffee, cinnamon, chocolate, cloves or vanilla are her favorite fragrances. It's a slow process, but she hopes smell training will bring back her ability to smell and taste things. And let's talk about losing your sense of smell with neuroscientist Rachel Hers. What I'd like to know first of all is if it could be permanent. So smell loss with COVID-19, we really don't know what permanent means. So it's only been about a year or so that we've been into this crisis. And it's certainly the case that with upper respiratory tract infections, smell loss occurs, but there's hope for regaining it in those conditions. And I think that probably will be the case here as well. And there are different methods that can facilitate that, especially things like smell training. Some people have been experiencing this, though, for months and months and months. I mean, a year can be a long time. How, how traumatic can that experience be emotionally and psychologically? Well, it's extremely traumatic. And one of the problems being, I mean, this idea of permanence, how long is it going to last? Is it going to be forever? You don't know. And so that uncertainty even adds more to it. And it's very traumatic to lose your sense of smell, which people unfortunately don't realize, because our sense of smell is connected to everything. People assume it's just connected to, can I smell the fire or the gas, you know, danger or the pleasure of food, but actually it's connected to our emotional life in very intense ways. It's connected to our social life. It's connected to our personal intimacy. It's connected to our sense of self and our memories and our sense of where we are in the universe with respect to other people on the whole world. So it can be extremely ungrounding and very, very disturbing for people to lose their sense of smell. So, Rachel, is this a side effect of something neurological? So, with COVID-19, what seems to be going on is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus needs to enter cells in order to infect the host, that is the human. And the nose has um, a patch called the olfactory epithelium. That's where olfactory sensory neurons are, where we detect smells. Also contains two other kinds of cells basal cells and what are known as supporting cells. And these supporting cells have a high number of the kind of enzyme that's needed for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to enter in. This ACE2 receptor people may be hearing about. So the, the virus can bind very easily to these cells. And what happens is it causes disruption and creates inflammation, which seems to be the reason why the olfactory sensory neurons shut down, because that's where we're normally detecting smells. And then then that's the first port of entry into the rest of the body. 
So that's the basic mechanism. So one of the things I have a kind of a pet peeve about is people really need to cover their nose with their mask because that's a primary route of entry for the SARS virus to get into you. Yep, just came across one of those colleagues in the corridors before. Uh, tell us, when does this happen, this, this loss of sense of smell? Is, is it an early symptom, as some healthcare workers have experienced before even testing positive? I mean, it could be a great warning uh, in stopping the spread of the disease, just like you were saying, warnings of, of a bad smell, of a fire, of gas. Yes, yeah, so what we've been involved in, I've been involved in research that was uh, conducted with Yale healthcare workers, and what we found was actually that disturbance in the sense of smell preceded getting a positive test by the PCR, you know, normal method of detecting, you know, biologically whether or not you've been infected by two whole days. So this is actually a tremendous finding that smell loss precedes getting a positive diagnosis and also precedes sort of feeling sick in other ways and actually is involved in about 86% of people who feel very mild symptoms or could otherwise be asymptomatic. So having smell loss is a very, very important signal to the individual to, first of all, get tested, and secondly, to self-isolate, to quarantine themselves then, because you want to be avoiding transmitting it into the population. So if you can self-quarantine at the first sign of noticing smell loss, that's really important. And not only smell loss, but also altered smell, what's known as parosmia. So if smelling things, but they don't smell right. You know, one person said to me, everything smelled like vinegar. And so that's also something that's a really important signal, early warning sign of COVID-19. And we saw that in about a third of the people who reported smell dysfunction in our study. I, I believe it's also a, a signal of Alzheimer's, of Parkinson's disease, but is it also a symptom of the new COVID variants? So just to clarify, the parosmia, the altered sense of smell, is not really so much, as far as we know, involved in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. And those things where smell loss occurs, that is decades before we see other symptoms. But you asked a really good question about the other variants. And I have to say that I don't know the answer to that yet. There hasn't been any research that I've seen that specifically looked at what variant of the COVID virus is causing or the, the SARS virus, rather, that's causing the illness and whether or not and how that's connected to smell loss? That's a great question. I unfortunately don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> like so many questions in this crisis. Um, my last question, can you fully retrain your sense of smell? So the good news is that because of the fact that it's an upper respiratory tract infection that causes smell loss, you haven't had neurological damage to the way that the neurons can get into the brain for detecting smell and so forth. So generally speaking, in these cases, there is hope for recovery. And the best method to date is actually exercising your nose, where what you want to do is get a set of very distinctive smells, so things that smell really different or that you remember smelled really different, like lemon or mint and you know some maybe perfume or cloves and things like that, and smell those scents multiple times per day, smell each for like about 10 seconds and repeat that over and over, let's say three or four times per day for about three months and then switch to another set. And the good news is that although it's not 100% effective, many people start to see improvement in their ability to smell through doing this sort of smell training, this exercising of your nose. So there is real hope, you know, and it doesn't take that long. It's just, like I said, you know, a few minutes, a couple of times a day, and um, just have to keep up with it. And it seems what's happening there is it's both training your brain and potentially causing your receptors to become re-stimulated again, reactivated to bring in more ability to actually smell. Great advice there from neuroscientist Rachel Hurst. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Over to Derek Williams now. Our science correspondent has been looking into your questions on the coronavirus. Does the immunity you acquire from the vaccine vary from person to person? Yes, it does. Um, vaccines never provide 100% protection, although a few that we've developed for other infectious diseases have come close. Um, but, but everyone's immune system is different and will respond 
to particular vaccines in individual ways. Um, trials showed that even after being vaccinated, some people who were exposed to SARS-CoV-2 ended up contracting symptomatic COVID-19. Um, but the vaccines being distributed now have proven to be pretty effective at preventing symptoms caused by most variants in most people. And, and some vaccines have proven extremely effective at doing so. Um, a simplified way of putting it would be to say that trials in some vaccines showed unvaccinated people were nearly 20 times more likely to develop symptoms of COVID-19 during the trial than someone who got vaccinated. But the really interesting point is that in trying to return to something like normal, vaccines don't actually have to prevent COVID-19 in everyone. If they can just stop symptomatic disease in most of us, um, that would ease the strain on health systems. And what would be even better is if vaccines could help slow or stop transmission of the virus. So if they not only prevent the disease in most people, but also keep people from catching it, having no symptoms and spreading it subsequently unknowingly. Um, there's new evidence that with at least one approved vaccine, uh, that's the case. That aspect really is key because it would break infection chains. Um, to do that right now, we're still relying mostly on, on blunt instruments like, like masks and lockdowns. And finally, um, there are strong indicators that even if you do catch COVID-19 after getting the shot, at least some of the vaccines are limiting its severity. So in other words, the people who get the disease even after being vaccinated rarely end up in hospitals. So, listen to your nose, thanks for watching, stay safe and see you again soon.